Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kyle, an iOS engineer at Square on the foundation team. Uh, on the foundation team, some of the things I work on are uh, Square Data, an internal core data uh, wrapper library we have to make using core data easier and more approachable to non-experts. Another example is a framework I just built called Lombard. Uh, it's a queuing framework we use to send cash payments, cash drawer events, up off of seller's iOS devices to Square's servers. I also spend time consulting with other teams that are less familiar with Register to ensure the features they're building are robust, extensible, and well-designed. <coughs> Tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about six of the things we've done to enable scaling the Register iOS engineering team and the Register product as a whole. I'm going to start with release trains, um, which is a simple and predictable way of shipping apps. After that is Keep It Shippable, a rule we use to keep trains short and quality high. Uh, after Keep Achievable is engineering design reviews, bleh, engineering design reviews, which helps ensures that uh, design is done before code is written. After engineering design reviews is testing and some of how we think about it. After testing comes code review and some of the efficiencies that we've developed around it with a larger team. Finally, I'm going to talk about our pull request status reports, which we use to ensure the review process is going well. Before I get in, into any of that, though, I'm going to talk about a little. I'm going to talk a little bit about what Register is. Uh, Jack covered some of this, but I'm going to go over it again because I rehearsed this. <laughs> uh, for, to start off with, Register has millions of sellers across the U.S. and many more all over the world. Um, and in 2014, we processed 30 billion dollars of credit card payments over Register. I still find it kind of crazy that I work on a thing that does that. Um, and finally, if you lumped all of our merchants together, they'd be the 13th largest retailer in the U.S. Register also supports a lot of inter interesting features like employee management, split tender, EMV, offline payments, uh, cash drawer management, and a whole bunch more stuff that you can see here. I'm not going to list them all. Uh, Register is also a universal app. It runs on your iPhone and your iPad. It also in integrates with a whole bunch of hardware like barcode scanners, printers, cash drawers, and our very own Square Stand. It also integrates with our newly released uh, EMV hardware, which lets our merchants accept chip cards. And as Jack mentioned, just yesterday we announced a brand new reader that supports Apple Pay. Uh, you'll be able to check it out downstairs after the talks. All right, to start off with, I'm going to talk about release trains um, and, and some of the things that we've done uh, as we've switched to trains. So to begin with, what exactly is a release train anyways? Well, what is a release train? It's a, it's a, <laughs> very different up here instead of when I'm normally rehearsing. Um, <laughs> uh, release train, it's a time-based method of shipping and delivering software, which means we ship to the App Store every two weeks. Um, this means that when Teams features are ready, they can essentially board the train um, and make their features available to customers. So what are some of the benefits of switching to trains? Well, more, there's more opportunities for Teams to ship and iterate. Um, we, we used to work under the waterfall release model where we'd ship just three to four times a year. With release trains, we now ship 20 times a year. This is super important for teams because they have more opportunities to ship and iterate and tweak their feature instead of having to get it, instead of having to get it completely right from day one. Uh, another advantage that ties into the, the short train cycle is that trains rarely slip. Because there's two weeks, two, two weeks between trains, there's less change in each of them, which means they ship to the App Store regularly. This is very important when you've met multiple teams contributing into and relying on a single product. So when we switched to trains, there's a lot of stuff that we had to change, but what I'm going to talk about tonight is probably the most important one, which is we have to learn to feature flag every, every new feature and, de in, and develop them incrementally. What do I mean by feature flag? Well, it's essentially a way to, God, mm, there we go, let's try this again. Uh, <laughs> third time's the charm. Um, what do I mean by feature flag? It's essentially a way to turn the feature off and not present it to customers before it's ready. For us, these come in a couple of flavors. There's server feature flags, which means the app pulls an endpoint to determine if the feature should be enabled. There's also compile time and runtime feature flags, meaning uh, the code is compiled out or not enabled when you build the app. Uh, I'll, prov um, I'll provide you a practical example of a feature flag because that kind of is a little bit abstract. So over the last several months, we've been working to replace the payments API in Register with the new newly designed API that adds first class support for some of the new features I covered earlier, like time tracking, employee management, split tender, EMV, all that kind of stuff. Uh, building this API into Register has taken several months, so it's obviously gated behind a feature flag. Um, now, that we're, now that we're finally ready to roll the uh, feature out to customers, the feature flag provides another benefit. Um, because it's a server-based feature flag, we can do a percentage-based rollout of the feature, meaning we turn it on for 1% of our sellers, look for problems, then we roll it out to 5%, 10%, and so on. Uh, this is super important for us, for a feature at the core of our register product, because a bug affecting even a very, very small percentage of users uh, can still affect hundreds or thousands of people. By doing a percentage-based rollout, we ensure that this doesn't happen, and if there were to be issues, we can roll it back immediately and affect almost no one. The second thing I'm going to talk about is keep it shippable. 
Um, what is keep achievable? Well, it's simply, it's a very simple rule. If you introduce a high, uh, high severity bugger regression into register that would prevent us from shipping a release, you have to fix it immediately. Uh, this, is, this ensures that manual testing can happen continuously, which helps catch bugs that we don't catch through our automated tests, like hardware integration um, and edge cases and things that only happen on real iPads. After keep it chippable are engineering design reviews. That, that's a little bit wordy, so let me like, tell you what a design review is. It's pretty simple. It's essentially just a document that details your thought process, your rationale, and your uh, high-level architecture and design decisions behind an engineering project. Why would you want to do a design review? Because that kind of just sounds like it'll stop you from coding. Well, for one, design, design mistakes before code is, uh, you want to catch design mistakes before code is written. Uh, if you've written 1,000 lines, 2,000 lines of code, but the overall architecture is wrong, it's very expensive to correct this. But if you just have a short snippet of pseudocode or a short description in a design document and a coworker spots a flaw, it's very easy to fix it before the code is written, which lets you move faster later. Um, next, architecture and code always last much longer than you think. It's very expensive to go back later and refactor or fix something because you could be working on a new feature. Design reviews ensure that you get the design right so the code can stay there for a long time. Um, next, software built by a single person always has blind spots and flaws. We work on a large team, so we want to make sure that everyone's voices are heard and that everyone's, everyone gets a chance to show their opinion. And finally, the design document you write actually provides great high-level documentation of the system. This is awesome for explaining what you're working on, for onboarding new engineers onto the project, or even for handing the project off to different engineers. So that's all great, but what actually goes into a design document? You can generally break these into about four pieces. First is approvers. You want to pick a couple of your coworkers that'll read the design document, provide feedback, and then approve it, or, or maybe even not approve it. Um, after that is your goals. What are you trying to do? Why are you embarking on this project? This could be reducing a crash rate, reducing memory usage, in, uh, speeding up user interactions, all that sort of stuff. Next is metrics. Uh, you want to be able to determine if your project succeeded or failed. This is, this is very important because you can't just write code and move on unless you, unless you know that you've learned something from it and you've succeeded. Finally, is your design. This is where you include the details of what you're going to build and why. So this is where you include an outline of your design, uh, an API overview, include example headers. Another thing you could cover is other explorations you did that didn't pan out, why didn't you pick these things, all that sort of stuff. This is essentially where you sell your design to yourself and your fellow coworkers. All right, so after design reviews comes testing. So now I'm going to, I'm going to talk about what testing is and is not, just so we can frame how we think about it on the register team. I'll begin with what testing is not. It's not, and this is super important, a silver bullet to software quality. Software quality is very inexact. To ensure that you have software quality, you need just to name just a few of these things, design and architecture review, code review, manual testing, alpha releases, beta releases, crash reporting, crash reporting, monitoring, logging, and probably a whole bunch of other stuff I'm forgetting to mention. I like to say here, there's no silver bullet to software quality, just a lot of rubber bullets. And testing is one of those rubber bullets. <laughs> Um, it's also not a replacement for a design and architecture process. Again, testing helps to ensure that code continues to work and that it doesn't regress, but it doesn't guarantee the code is well designed to begin with. Testing bad, bad code can certainly make you more confident in the code as you move forward, but it doesn't improve the quality of the code itself. Um, next, it's not a replacement for code review. This is very similar, in a very similar vein to the, it's not a replacement for architecture review. You still need your coworkers to review your code to make sure it's sane, it's understandable, and that it's well designed. Uh, tests will not help you here. So that's all great. What is testing for anyways then? So it's a highly cost-effective way to avoid regressions. You can avoid the need for reams of tribal knowledge on your team by ensuring every component is well tested. This also lets engineers move with confidence because they won't break the product. This is super important as your team evolves and your product grows. Um, next, it's a highly cost-effective way to find bugs before shipping or before even merging to master. And finally, and this is a super important one, it's a great way to reduce the feedback time between finding a failure and, 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 then, and then fixing it. If you're relying on manual testing, it could be days, weeks, or potentially even months before a manual tester or yourself finds a bug when tapping around the app. With something like a unit test, you can know within just a few seconds uh, if and why you've caused a failure with very good granularity. All right, after testing, I'm gonna move on to code review. You all probably know what a code review is. You've probably all done one on GitHub, so I won't cover that. Instead, I'll talk about some of the process efficiencies we've implemented in the last six months at Square to make uh, code reviews much faster in the register code base. So again, I'll start with what code review is not. It's not, and this is important, again, to make the entire code base look like it was written by one person. While having a style guide and style consistency is certainly very important, um, this is very expensive to uh, maintain and achieve manually as your team grows. 
plus absolute adherence to a style guide doesn't improve the, materially improve the quality of the product you're shipping to your customers. Uh, we now enforce our, our style guide automatically with a tool that's now on our GitHub page called Space Commander. Alan built it. You can check it out at github.com slash square slash space commander. I highly recommend it. It saves us a bunch of time in all reviews. And next, as I mentioned earlier, it's not architecture review. If you're doing architecture review after code is written, I highly recommend introducing, introducing some sort of design or API review section before you start writing code. So that's what code review is not. What do you have to do to achieve a good code review? Well, for us, this boiled down to optimizing two parts of the review, from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, the side of the, uh, the author of the code and the side of the reviewer of the code. Both sides have to um, ensure, uh, both sides have to work to ensure a smooth code review process. So as a submitter, what do you have to do to set your reviewers up for an efficient review? Well, to start, be descriptive. Don't just open a code review with a thousand lines of code and walk away. Also make sure you include a description of what you're changing and why you're changing it. If you're changing UI, include a before and after screenshot or even a before and after video. Um, this helps your reviewers know what they're reviewing, why they're reviewing it, and what they should be looking for. Second, be consumable and be focused. All your code reviews should be under around 500 lines. There's no hard and fast rule here, but we found 500 lines is about a good number so the reviewer can concentrate on it for 20 to 30 minutes and then move on to something else. Uh, next, be focused. Make sure your, each pull request you're opening has exactly one focus. Don't mix very mechanical changes like header reorganizations and renames with complicated changes like refactors and new features. Always, again, split these into separate pull requests so the reviewers know what they're reviewing. Next, be self-reviewed. This is a super simple thing, but a lot of people don't do it. What is a self-review? Well, basically, open the pull request, walk away for 10 minutes, and then come back and review your code as if it was someone else's. This includes leaving yourself comments um, and so on. You'll always catch problems. This is great because as the original author of the code, you're much more in tune with the subtleties and intentions of it than the other reviewers will be. And next, explicitly list reviewers. We found that with a larger team, it's very important to say, Eric, I want you to review this pull request. That way, everyone knows exactly what's on their review plate and reviews will get done quickly. You don't have people waiting for others to review code. As I mentioned, though, being a submitter is only half the story. As reviewers, you also have to do your part to ensure code reviews go efficiently. So first, be clear. This is an important one, but a lot of people end up missing it unintentionally. What, what do I mean? Basically, just when you leave a comment, don't just say, this sucks, or do it this way. Also explain why you want to do it this way. This is because a lot of context gets lost when you turn that uh, thought into a comment. Next, be pragmatic. You have a limited amount of time to spend on your review, and the author has a limited amount of time to spend on fixing your comments. Make sure you're focusing on things that materially improve the quality of the product. Don't spend time nitpicking on inconsequential things. And next, document your requirements. Another really simple one. This basically means that when you leave a comment, document if it's a requirement to merge the pull request, a nice to have, a nitpick, a question, a tip, something for the person to do next time, something like that. This again helps the author prioritize their fixes. And finally, be helpful. Again, very simple. Um, as, a code, as, a, as a reviewer, your job is you're, you're not trying to block someone from merging code. You're trying to make sure that they get their code merged and shipped as fast as possible. Um, always strive to, always strive to like, have a delightful review. The last thing I'll talk about tonight is our pull request status reports. This sounds kind of wordy, but it's actually been super useful. These come in two flavors for us. First is the daily pull request status report, which I send out to the team every morning. This simply contains things like high open severity bugs that need to be fixed immediately, open uh, pull requests that need approvers, as well as review balancing between engineers. Uh, highlighting review balancing we found is super important because if one engineer has 15 things to review but another four people on your team have nothing, this, this reveals two problems. One, all those pull requests are going to take a very long time to review because that one engineer has to go and review those 15 things. Another more subtle thing uh, that this causes is that you're going to have poor knowledge distribution within your team. This means that one engineer is going to know a lot about what's going on and other engineers will know very little, which isn't good. And second, we have a thing called the weekly velocity report, which contains two very simple metrics, the number of pull requests we merged that week, and how long on average it took us to merge them. Uh, we, try, we try to merge our pull requests in under two days. What we look for here is we watch the report week over week. If we see a dropping number of pull requests and an increasing review time, this means people aren't properly breaking apart their pull requests into nicely reviewable pieces. So that's all I have for you tonight. Um, uh-oh, I forget my last slide. Oh, no. <laughs> um, 
these are just some of the things we've done. If you want to go check out a little bit more, I wrote an article on OBCIO a couple of months ago called Scaling Square Register, which is kind of a superset of this talk. Um, this isn't static, though. We're constantly evolving our processes as we determine what doesn't work and what does work. Um, that's all. Thank you. Next up, we have Brian. Brian.